I'd now like to call up our first panel. Um, I will briefly introduce our panelists. You've already met our first panelist, Joseph Humeyer, Executive Director of the Center for a Secure Free Society. To his left, we have Selena Rialuyo, a professor of practice at the William J. Perry Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies at the National Defense University, where she focuses on US national security, illicit networks, transnational organized crime, counterterrorism, cybersecurity, and anti-money laundering and counter-threat finance issues. As a former US diplomat, international banker with Goldman Sachs, State Department Director of Counterterrorism Finance Programs, consultant and professor at the National Defense, George Washington and Joint Special Operations Universities. She has two decades of international experience in the public, private, and academic sectors. Professor Rialuyo is a regular commentator on global affairs for CNN and Espanol, foreign policy, Reuters, and Univision, and has testified before Congress on national security, terrorism, and crime issues. Our third panelist to her left is Elon Berman, Senior Vice President of the American Foreign Policy Council in Washington, D.C. Elon is an expert on regional security in the Middle East, Central Asia, and the Russian Federation. He's consulted for both the U.S. CIA and Department of Defense and provided assistance on foreign policy and national security issues to a range of governmental agencies and congressional offices. He's been called one of America's leading experts on the Middle East and Iran by CNN. <laughs> Elon is a frequent writer and commentator. He's written for the Wall Street Journal, Foreign Affairs, the New York Times, Foreign Policy, Washington Post, and USA Today, among many other publications. Elon is the editor of four books, including Iran's Strategic Penetration of Latin America, which was co-edited with Joseph Humeyer, and the author of four others, most recently writing on Iran's Deadly Ambition, the Islamic Republic's Quest for Global Power. And our moderator for this panel is Leah Soibel. Leah has more than a decade, decade of experience on the ground in Israel, the US, and Latin America, working with hundreds of global Latino journalists. In 2012, she founded Fuente Latina, headquartered in Miami with offices in Jerusalem, Madrid, and Los Angeles. Fuente Latina has brought 300 journalists to Israel, facilitated 35,000 accurate TV, radio, and print stories, reaching millions of Latinos worldwide, and their work has resulted in two TV Emmy wins and an AP Broadcasting Award. Leia's efforts in Latin America has led to a measurable shift in attitudes towards the world's only Jewish state, and this has helped push back against the anti-Semitic forces, promoting false narratives about Israel and the Jewish community. So without further ado, I will now turn this over to Leia to begin our first panel. Wonderful. Good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to take 10 seconds um, while I have the moderator seat to say that it is quite incredible that this event is taking place today. I don't think we really realize the importance of it. Um, it may seem that there are a lot of these types of events that take place on the Hill, but the fact that we are all here today, one week after Argentina finally blacklisted Hezbollah as a terrorist organization, given the work of the three distinguished panelists here today and many of the partners and individuals in this room really is quite remarkable. And without much ado, I do really, I wanna go straight into the questions because we don't have much time. And so Joseph, I'm gonna start with you. Um, now that we have Hezbollah designated in Argentina as a terrorist organization, what happens next? And what are the chances that other Latin American uh, countries are now gonna take, uh, follow suit with that? Okay, so that, that is really the key question, right? What's the way forward, what happens now? Um, it took a lot to get here, but there's, I think, three things that we have to perhaps um, um, echo. One is we now have a clear path on how to do this. Uh, for a lot of time, Leah, you know this, and I know Selena and, and Ilan know this as well, that uh, a lot of people in Latin America thought this was impossible, not just because of the political dynamics, but also technical. They didn't have the right legislation, uh, there wasn't the legal framework, um, and so a lot of people thought technically this wasn't able to do as well. Um, many countries in Latin America thought that the UN list was sufficient to be able to mirror for their uh, efforts to be able to um, um, go after terrorist groups. Hezbollah is not on the UN list. 
Um, so I think now we have a, a path, both a political path and we have a technical path of how this is done in, in Argentina. Now, this is not going to be exactly the same in other countries in Latin America, but I think we have a kind of a, a roadmap on how to do this. Uh, the, the second thing is in Argentina specifically, and I, I will, I'll let the uh, representatives of Argentina speak more specifically on this, but I know that uh, they have a registry. It now needs to be populated. Right? They need to put names in the registry. Uh, I know that's a, 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 an ongoing effort. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of uh, Hezbollah facilitators, fixers, uh, financiers uh, that are uh, implicated in the AMI attack. I imagine many of those will go onto this registry that uh, is now uh, public in Argentina. But I imagine that other, it's going to be uh, other governments in Latin America and, and the world, really, that will help Argentina populate their list with knowledge of uh, individuals and entities that are also operating in their countries that have a connection to Argentina. Um, my understanding of the registry is that it has to have a local connection. It has to have a connection in Argentina to qualify to be on the list, but I know Congressman Petri will, will clarify all this for us. So I think those are the two things. One is we have a roadmap to do this. Uh, we have to help Argentina populate their registry so that this gets stronger. And then I'd say, I'd say finally, and this is, you know, for those that were at the ministerial, I know some people here that were at the ministerial last, um, last week in, in Buenos Aires, um, it, it, it was a very, very uh, uh, proud moment, uh, obviously a historic moment. President Macri reserves a lot of the credit. Though I should say that there are certain governments in Latin America that still do not uh, uh, acknowledge that this is taking place. There are still some governments in Latin America that resist uh, these efforts. Uh, most notable, and it's no secret to anybody in the room, is the, uh, the, the government of uh, Venezuela or, or the, the Maduro regime, as, as, as we more refer to it in here in Washington, um, is absolutely not going to play ball with any of this, I think the Morales government in Bolivia is, is right alongside with it. So there's gonna be resistance in pockets of the region that definitely see this uh, as an attack on them because they have uh, networks that, that they intertwine with Hezbollah and other uh, designated terror groups. So I think we're gonna to have to figure out a way through that as well. Um, that's not to say that that's impossible, but I think that those countries um, in many respects uh, have become enablers of, of these kind of networks, not just on the terrorist side, but also on the organized crime side. Uh, a lot, you know, Hezbollah is well known as a transnational criminal organization and they launder massive amounts of money. I think some, uh, some analysts in Washington have called it uh, the Western Union or the Federal Express for drug cartels in the region. So uh, I think uh, even on that front, I think we'll be able to make uh, some headway. So. And uh, before I go on to the next panelist, I, who do you think, which country do you think is going to be next? That's a great question, right? Uh, I'm the worst at predicting anything, uh, as anyone knows in my stock predictions. So uh, I will uh, not, don't take, you know. Uh, I will say this, in the ministerial, uh, the loudest voice, aside from Argentina, and I think the strongest arguments came from Colombia. Uh, and I do believe Colombia uh, is gonna, they're going to host, I'm understanding, the next ministerial in January of next year, uh, mid-January. And I, I believe Colombia has very much of the same, uh, obviously they're not, not, an AMIA didn't happen in Argentina, but they have, they have a lot of the same technical capabilities. They're very professional counterterrorism officials in Colombia, both on the intelligence side, but also on the law enforcement side uh, with their prosecutors and, 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 and others. So I, I believe Colombia is a country that could potentially do this. Obviously, it's not going to happen on its own. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. But uh, I would look at then the other, the other countries in the tri-border, Paraguay, Brazil, I'd hope that they would uh, assume this challenge as well. Uh, I know that it's, it, they have different obstacles in their countries. There's large Lebanese populations, and obviously not the Lebanese population in itself is not being indicted here. There, there's a lot of honest and very good and, and, and uh, productive contributors to society uh, from those populations. So we have to figure out a way to not uh, uh, target everybody and, and, and when you're looking at one group. But uh, Colombia would be my uh, guess. But again, you know my record in the stock market, so. Thank you, Joseph. So, Selena, let's talk finance uh, for a moment. There are a lot of articles that have actually come out recently saying that uh, recent U.S. sanctions are having significant uh, cash flow uh, repercussions on Hezbollah. Is, number one, can you address that if it's true or not? And number two, regarding Argentina's designation of Hezbollah as a terrorist organization now, do you see any financial implications? Sure. So first, I'd like to commend Joseph and his team for putting this event together. We were there on Thursday. It was a very moving experience to be 
at the AMIA commemoration. I've been following this since 2002. In the fall of 2002, when I was the coordinator for terrorist financing at the State Department, I was sent down to the tri-border to investigate a Vanity Fair piece that said um, Al-Qaeda had terror training camps in the tri-border. What did I discover? The Lebanese Hezbollah financing and support networks. And that's a major piece because many countries have objected because Hezbollah is technically a political party. They would always couch it in this it's not an operational zone, it's more for fundraising and for support networks. But without those support networks, these terrorist groups cannot actually um, realize their nefarious agendas. So we take a look at the financing piece, and the other work that I've been doing is this concept of the convergence of terrorism and crime, and Hezbollah is a clear example, where they take advantage of their tentacles around the world that are involved in criminal networks as well as the financing piece, and the money laundering, particularly in terms of uh, trafficking cocaine. The designation of Hezbollah in Argentina is very important. And then now, as Joseph alluded to, we need to start helping them populate with the names of these financiers. As our colleague from the Justice Department, what wasn't touted is that we've actually accomplished several very important extraditions of um, uh, narcotics traffickers and money launderers, who we believe also have um, ties to financing Hezbollah out of the tri-border. So this idea of, A, naming and shaming them internationally, but we have to bring it to, the, the, to bear much more in terms of impact. First, to identify who the people are, then do the investigations. And this is where, because of the transnational nature, and many of these um, suspects are dual nationals, how you bring them to justice. And I know that the US government, because I've been involved in this, we're doing a lot of training um, with the tri-border nations to step up the game in terms of uh, bringing these terrorist financiers and money launderers um, uh, to justice. Because as was uh, noted before, um, money is the lifeblood for any terrorist organization. And I was delighted to see in the communique last Friday at the ministerial, there are several chapters that really focus on the role of financial intelligence, financial intelligence units, and then more importantly, how it has to be a part, a much more active part of how we uncover but more importantly, pursue not just the terrorists themselves, but those who finance and back them. Thank you, Selena. Um, and before I continue to Elon, um, I just want to say we will be taking some questions from the audience. If you do have any questions, please put them down in the note card that was on your seat and raise your hand and somebody will come by and pick them up and we'll read them here at the end. So Elon, Iran, the bigger picture, Let, let's, let's get out of focus a little bit from Latin America and, and let's take a global view of this. What do you think are really the implications now of the designation in Argentina? Does it have any impact on Iran per se? What has been the feedback from Tehran? Right, so I, I think that's a great question and that's a good place to start in this conversation because you have to know where you were in order to know where you're going. Exactly. So uh, as Joseph alluded to in his introductory remarks, uh, he and I have been kicking around, around the region together for a long time. We started taking trips down there in 2012 when we were trying to essentially answer a very simple question, which is, to what extent had Iran penetrated Latin America uh, as part of a strategy? So remember, historically at the time, Iran was being squeezed uh, by multilateral and US sanctions. Uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was the president of Iran. Um, certainly something resembling persona non grata in diplomatic circles, Iran was beginning to feel the pinch uh, in a pretty substantial way uh, in terms of uh, its economic freedom of action. And so we were seeing all these telltale signs that this was translating into a greater Iranian forward presence in Latin America. Uh, the problem was that here in Washington, no one had bothered to go down and look. And so what you had was this scenario where some people said that this was uh, simply fabricated and some people said that the barbarians were within the gates. And there was really no objective ground truth. So we had this crazy idea that we would go down uh, to places like Bolivia and Ecuador and Colombia and Argentina and so on and so forth and take a look and, and see what was happening. And we found out that both sides were wrong, effectively. That Iran did have a strategy in the region, but it was a, an opportunistic strategy. It was one that was intended to uh, circumvent uh, US and European sanctions and essentially uh, look at permissive financial environments in Latin America uh, to try to uh, sanctions bust. Um, but also that it was beginning in a very real way 
to leverage relationships uh, on an ideological level with, uh, at that time, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, um, uh, with uh, Rafael Correa in Ecuador, uh, with others, uh, to uh, leverage the ALBA bloc, uh, the Bolivarian Alliance of the Americas, in order to essentially create a footprint that it would have, that would be greater than it would have otherwise. Um, and what's useful to remember here is that Iran, at the time, was talking about coming to our neighborhood because we were in theirs. Right? This was a time when the US was much more heavily involved in uh, on the ground, boots on the ground in Iraq. And the Iranians uh, sort of made a signal that the Western Hemisphere was not off limits as a result. So fast forward all of this, uh, more than half a decade. And what we're looking at is an Iran that is, again, feeling the squeeze from an international sanctions campaign. And let's be clear, it's international, right? The Trump administration is leading, the European allies and the Asian allies are balking, but they're slowly but surely, they're coming around. And so Iran is increasingly feeling the pinch in much the same way that it was in 2011, 2012. And it stands to reason that uh, Latin America, because not a whole lot has changed in Latin America uh, in terms of uh, financial rigidity, and Selena can talk to that uh, more, but it's still, at least from the Iranian perspective, a permissive environment. Um, there, there's two things to, to take away from all this. First of all, that Iran's penetration of Latin America is a long-term project. It was not something that started with Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, although Ahmadinejad and Hugo Chavez had very good personal relations. Uh, it was something that uh, Hassan Rouhani, the current Iranian president, has reaffirmed as a strategic goal. And it's also something that becomes more and more attractive to Iran as uh, Iran feels squeezed again uh, in terms of its ability to move around in, uh, uh, in the international financial system. So uh, while history does not repeat itself, uh, very often history rhymes. And what we're looking at coming down the pike may be a resurgence of Iranian activity in Latin America the same way that Joseph and I saw it in uh, the beginning of the decade. Great. Uh, did anybody have any cards? Do you want me to, can I add something? Yeah, please. So, so I want, I, as we wait for questions from the audience, I want to maybe add a little bit to what Ilan's saying, because as you mentioned, we have been working on this for or quite a long time. Um, two things. One, just since we have a large contingent from the diplomatic corps of embassies um, here with us today, uh, I want to perhaps speak to you. Um, you know, I, know I, under, I understand the challenge of this. Uh, I've been working it for a very long time. And I, and I want to make sure the public understands uh, the challenge, uh, both the public challenge and also the political challenge. Um, for a long time, uh, the connotation of the word terrorism in Latin America was very different to what we look at terrorism here in Washington. Uh, you know, when we think of terrorism, particularly in a post 9-11 era, we think of uh, Islamic terrorism, we think of international terrorism, we think of bombs, we think of uh, non-state actors running around in, in, in establishing networks. But in Latin America, uh, for a lot of countries, uh, the connotation of the word terrorism had to do with state terrorism, uh, governments uh, abusing their powers and going after NGOs and civil society groups and violating human rights to be able to use their counterterrorism authorities in a way that actually would uh, pursue uh, civil society. Uh, there's a, periods of military dictatorships in Latin America in the 80s, 70s and 80s, and then there's periods, obviously, of abusive government power. I, I don't think we're actually that far from that today. I mean, if you look at countries like Venezuela, I think you see some of that as well. You see the government calling people terrorists, terrorists uh, they, they call political parties terrorist group, and then fundamentally the opposition elements that are just trying to uh, play uh, a democratic game. Um, so I think that that connotation has not gone away. What happened in Argentina was very important. Uh, what happened in Argentina was very effective, but that doesn't mean that the Argentine population now thinks that terrorism is 100% their problem or that it's uh, all attributed to uh, international groups, uh, namely Hezbollah or Iran. So I think there's a lot of work, a lot of work that needs to be done on uh, the public education side on understanding that the public understands that these networks, I mean, to, just give me, give you a little bit on Hezbollah. You know, we look at Hezbollah and we think, okay, they're doing stuff in Lebanon, they're doing stuff in Syria, now, you know, Yemen, Iraq, uh, in tribe borders, the historic area. But here's what people don't know about Hezbollah. Uh, if you, anyone's familiar with the U.S. Army Green Berets, uh, the Special Forces, right? What, what do the Special Forces do? They go to other countries and they train surrogate actors. They train indigenous groups. They train folks 
to fight battles with us, but not directly connected to us. Uh, um, that is the mandate of the U.S. Special Forces community. Hezbollah operates like the Special Forces of Iran, uh, working with the Quds Force. There are groups today in Latin America that have nothing to do with Shia Islam. They have nothing to do with uh, Iran's uh, Islamic revolution. Um, there are groups that, have, uh, that were created mostly for domestic reasons and domestic grievances, but have been co-opted by Hezbollah. I'll name a few of these groups. The Quebracho from Argentina. Right? The Quebracho from Argentina is not considered uh, an Islamist group uh, by any stretch of the imagination. It's more of a agiprop group that was working to uh, you know, basically drive a narrative against uh, capitalism and U.S. hegemony and things like that. Well, what would we find out when we locked, knocked into Nisman's uh, wiretaps? What did we find out? They were uh, funded, they were supported, and they were linked to Iran uh, through a gentleman that's now in jail, Fernando Esteche. The Enocaceristas from Peru, the Cocaleros from Bolivia, the Colectivos from Venezuela. These aren't commonly or prominently known as members of uh, the Global Jihad or the Islamist terrorist movement, but they are linked. And that goes to what Selena was saying. There is a convergence, and that convergence goes beyond just organized crime and terrorism. That convergence goes into agiprop groups. That convergence goes into uh, nation states. Uh, there is a convergence happening because, as they say in the military, uh, amateurs talk strategy, but professionals talk logistics. At the end of the day, the logistical networks that uh, is what brings all these countries, all these actors together. Uh, and I think that is what Latin America needs to uh, address. Because it, as they were told us in the past, uh, Elon, you know, we're a logistic hub, right? We're not the target. Well, if you're a logistic hub, then you're not just a logistic hub for Islamist terror. You're logistic for all these negative actors. Uh, and there's certain nation states that are helping it. So I think that that's uh, one thing. And one more last point, and I promise I'll shut up. Um, you know, there, there is a fear. I think uh, among the folks that know, the credible folk, uh, in the counterterrorism community in Latin America, there is a fear. Uh, and I understand it. Um, you know, we were attacked by Hezbollah. I, I'm a U.S. Marine, and, and, and the Marines were one of the first attacks by Hezbollah in 1983. So we, we get it. Um, as someone said in the ministerial, you know, um, in, in the Spanish is, um, no llamemos al diablo, right? Let's, let's not call the devil. Well, the devil's already here. Uh, so we have to deal with it. Um, Hezbollah is not Al-Qaeda, it's not Daesh. It's not going to randomly select targets and just go after uh, terrorist attacks just because they want to create a media narrative. Hezbollah is strategic, they're calculated, they're patient, and they work with Iran. So they, they you know, the attack in Amia, they had nothing against Argentina. There was no reason for Hezbollah to attack Argentina. The only reason they attacked Argentina was because Iran told it to do so. And that's all it needs. If Iran wakes up tomorrow and says, I want to attack any country in the Western Hemisphere, Hezbollah will act. And they are prepared and ready to act. We have to be ready to counter that. Uh, the point, point of anti-terrorism is to anticipate these terror actions and neutralize them. It's, it's insufficient to wait for a bomb to go off and say, oh, wow, I told you there was a problem over there. Um, and the only way to do that is to criminalize the action of being a terrorist. Uh, if you put a shirt on and it says Hezbollah, you should be prosecuted, at least investigated. Uh, and that wasn't the case in Latin America. I think Elon knows there was a store of Al-Qaeda or an internet cafe of Al-Qaeda in Sao Paulo at the time. So I wanted to kind of uh, encapsulate the challenge in Latin America that uh, maybe folks that haven't worked on this issue um, uh, maybe don't understand. Uh, it's not as easy as it sounds, and I fully understand all the connotations of the term and the variances of the interpretations, but uh, it is a serious challenge that I think that we have to assume collectively. Thank you, Joseph. So we have eight minutes left, um, and I'm gonna, actually, I received one, one uh, card from someone in the audience, um, and that's a very good question, whoever uh, posed it. I, I was actually gonna pose the same question. It has taken us so long to get to this point. That's what I was trying to say in my opening remarks, is that we, we, we're sitting here and we, we, we should be elated that we've come this far, 
but it's been so frustrating in each of our fields, whether it's educating the public and the media through what I do and in each of your own fields of expertise, whether it's at the political level, the financial level, it has been really an uphill challenge despite all of the excellent intelligence and information that's been out there pointing fingers at Hezbollah and Iran all this time. The fact that we've come here and we're sitting here today doesn't mean that when the event's over today, our job is done. We actually have so much more work ahead of us to continue this uphill struggle. The question that was posed is, how do we prevent this lag going forward? As it only allows our adversaries to strengthen while this lag continues. And we've seen that all along in, in the decade, more than a decade now, that all of us have been talking about this issue Iran and Hezbollah have only continued to strengthen their activities in Latin America and elsewhere and even here in the United States. So if you had one or two messages for the audience and, and for the cameras, in each of your respective fields, what do you think is, is the point moving forward that we can't allow to happen anymore based on our past experiences so that we can push this agenda forward and faster? Okay, I'll start. Um, let me try, I'm a, a little bit of an absent-minded professor, so let me try to sort of uh, narrow this down as neatly as possible. I think there's really three big takeaways here. Uh, the first of, it, of them is political. Uh, Joseph, I think, is absolutely right when he talks about uh, the tendency, the regional political tendency to sit on the sidelines, not to, to not call the devil, to uh, sort of not make provocative actions, right? If you look along the length and breadth of Latin America, what you essentially have is you have three groups. We have groups who are facilitators or enablers, right, for ideological reasons or for infrastructural reasons. Uh, you have groups who are observers, right, who don't want to uh, make any sudden moves so that they don't become more attractive as targets or more attractive as uh, points of exploitation. And you have what we used to talk about when we talked about China, we don't so much anymore, responsible stakeholders or increasingly responsible stakeholders. Uh, countries that are willing to take a, not only a local, but maybe even a regional role in policing uh, good governance, good corporate practices, and uh, creating a less permissive environment. Our goal, politically, has to be to expand that last group by eating into the middle group and reducing the freedom of action of the first group. And I think that's a hugely important uh, thing that has started now as a result of the Argentine designation, but it certainly doesn't end there. And so that should be our political goal. The second task is administrative. Latin America does not have anything resembling a coherent framework for counterterrorism uh, in the same way that we would think about it in North America. Um, Joseph and I uh, co-edited a book in 2016 uh, called Iran's Strategic Penetration of Latin America, which talked about a lot of these uh, issues. But in the chapter that I wrote, um, as part of that chapter, I had uh, one of my researchers look at which countries in Latin America and the Caribbean uh, actually had on the books at the time uh, counterterrorism frameworks of the same kind that has existed in the United States since the late 1990s. The answer was, of the 33 countries of Latin America and the Caribbean, less than half. And that's only slightly better now. And so for threat actors, for violent organizations that are looking at permissive environments, Latin America is still very attractive, and we have to reduce that. Um, and the third is we have to be cognizant not just in terms of our weaknesses in the region, but also in terms of potential political changes that could bring dangers to our doorstep. And here, the question that Leah asked me about Iran is, I think, very germane. Uh, what we've discovered in other fields, in adjacent fields, uh, fields like uh, cyber warfare, for example, is that Iran is a dynamic actor, that Iran's interests change as a result of the fact that it has enormously volatile political relationship with the United States and increasingly with the international community. That may make the activities of both Iran itself and its proxies uh, different and challenging in new ways as we move forward. And so it's not enough just to look at the terror threat in Latin America as it exists today. We should also be thinking creatively about how it may evolve in the next uh, several years and how we get ahead of that curve as well. So I think we're living a very interesting time with uh, an actually alignment in terms of political will to go after 
as well as, as, well as other groups which were actually included in the communique um, last Friday. What I would like to try to look at is how do we train and change that political will and translate that to actual actions. And I think there are several things that we need to, A, be able to train, and more importantly, keep abreast all of our experts who are in the intel and then in law enforcement and the judicial components, not just in the United States, but our counterparts downrange. Because we know who these people are. It's a matter of putting together credible cases um, and more importantly, sharing intelligence and sharing information, not just within our countries, but across borders. Because these are trans-regional actors. And more importantly, we have now, over the last 10 years, deliberately included financial intelligence in all of our law enforcement and um, criminal investigations. That should not, um, we should actually double down on that. Because the money tells a tale. As opposed to, I would do a lot of work in Mexico where some of our informants disappear or change their tune, but the money and the communications are critical components of any of these cases. How do you bring them to justice? We have to bring these people to justice. Also because by bringing them to justice, it creates a deterrence for others who will think about being these aiders and abettors. We've always gone against the terrorists, what we call the command and control. What we have to take a look at are these broader structures of supporters who provide safe haven who promote propaganda, as well as the financiers, and then more importantly, take advantage of a real interesting political time in Latin America now, where many of the countries now share the same goals of promoting security and prosperity in the hemisphere, and particularly are much more aware of what we call external actors, and those external actors include China, Russia, Iran, Hezbollah, and more importantly, change and transform that political will into concrete actions, and now is the time to actually do it. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything that Elon and Selena has said. That's not uh, very unusual, actually, but um, uh, we, uh, we tend to agree quite a bit. We work together on these issues. Um, the only thing I'll emphasize or re-emphasize is something I said earlier is the public education part of this. Um, you know, there's a, uh, something a, a, uh, one of my favorite economists once said, uh, Milton Friedman, that uh, he said that politicians are like corks in the ocean, right? and and the job of civil society is to move the move the tide. So whichever way the tide goes is kind of in some ways the way the the politicians go. So with that tide being public sentiment and public opinion, and I think that that's where we're going to probably find our biggest roadblock. Uh, we may have political actors that have the political will. We may have uh, you know training and technical aspects that are happening, which are are happening as as uh, as the Department of Justice mentioned today, uh, Treasury, State, all this. Uh, but if the public doesn't get this, if the public in Latin America just, if this is just too foreign for them, uh, this won't, A, it may happen, things like uh, in Argentina, but they won't be sustainable. Uh, meaning that they, they, you know, an, an, a change of government could take place and they could easily remove it if it's, if it's an executive decree that doesn't even require to go through the Congress. So I think a public education is going to be a big part of that. How we do that is it has to be a little more creative. I don't think, and I've worked in Latin America a very long time, I don't think, uh, running down to the region and saying, look, every Hezbollah's everywhere and Iran's gonna attack, and it just an alarmist message won't work. Uh, I think uh, we have to be uh, creative in how we uh, explain to them that, uh, I think the convergence argument is a strong argument, because uh, uh, it's a technical argument, it's an academic argument. National Defense University has already published two books on this with some of the best experts in, 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 well, in the US, but uh, and some in Latin America. So I think that's a, a big part of it, uh, using strong arguments that Latin Americans can understand and relate to, um, and then making them popularized uh, so that the, the politicians can absorb these things and, and, and translate them in ways that their constituents uh, are concerned about. Uh, organized crime is one of those. Uh, I think every government in Latin America has organized crime as one of their top uh, uh, national security concerns. Uh, well, we have news for them. Hezbollah is a major organized crime group. I mean, they are, in some cases, I would say, they operate more as an organized crime than they do as a terrorist group. Uh, but just because, you know, if, if someone comes and robs my house and then kills my brother, that doesn't just mean he robbed my house. That doesn't just mean he's a, he's a robber. That means he's also a murderer. So we can't distinguish all those actions. I mean, Hezbollah obviously is an organized crime group. They engage in massive amounts of money laundering, uh, drug trafficking, primarily cocaine trafficking. Uh, but they also kill people. Uh, and we can never forget that fact. 
Uh, and I think that's a, the public education side is a big part of it for me. And that's actually, I should say, that's pretty much uh, Leah, your, your, your big involvement. In, uh, Leah uh, works at, uh, she leads this group called Fuente Latina. And so aside from my trips with Elan to Latin America, I've taken a lot of trips with Leah, um, more on the public side where uh, she would arrange interviews with a range of media outlets uh, in Spanish, mostly in these countries. And uh, my job is just to sit in front of a camera and speak until, uh, until I can't speak anymore. Uh, but that's, I mean, those, those kind of things, and not just me, I mean, there's plenty of people that we could draw upon uh, expertise in, in Europe, in, in, in Israel, uh, and here in the United States and in other parts of the region. So thank you for your work as well. So time has run out, but I will end with what you said, Joseph, is that um, a lot of the voices over the last decade that have been speaking up about this important issue have been coming from outside of Latin America. And I think it's more important moving forward that we have more organic voices from within the region that are able to speak to, to the, each and every one of their target audiences in a, a vocal and public way to continue educating a broader audience about the threat of Hezbollah and other terrorist and extremist actors in the region. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, panelists. And because this is a media slash policy finance panel, we are taking a selfie. Okay. <laughs>